Hello, I'm William Porter, author of Alcohol Explained, and I thought it would be useful just to put together a quick slideshow just to show the main physiological effects of alcohol. When I'm talking about the physiological effects of alcohol, what I'm really talking about is the chemical effect alcohol has on us as human beings. Now, what I thought it'd be useful to cover off is firstly how the human brain works, the nature of alcohol and how that affects the brain. When we've got that basic concept in place, then we can seek to understand a bit more about alcohol withdrawal, how the withdrawal increases in intensity over time. That also feeds into the concept of tolerance. Um, and then un helps us understand why moderation is so difficult for so many people. Um, it's also then, I think, it feeds very well into how alcohol affects sleep. And then separately, we'll look at the issue of intoxication. Um, and what I do want to emphasise is that this is intended to be a brief talk just on the physiological effects, not the psychological effects. Um, addiction and dependency is made up of the chemical and the physiological but also the psychological we're only looking at the physiological in this so the human brain is phenomenally complicated and we really don't have a full understanding of how it works but what we do know is that it creates and secretes its own naturally occurring chemicals drugs and hormones so things like adrenaline and endorphins are things you've probably heard of. Um, how it works is, it works by way of homeostasis, which is essentially a balance in the brain. And it's a very delicate balance. Now, we as human beings don't even have a complete list of all the chemicals, drugs and hormones that the, bra the, that the brain creates and excretes still less do we understand how they all balance and interact with each other but what we do know is that it is a very delicate balancing act orchestrated by the brain um, and i think it's useful to imagine a self-contained ecosystem um, so something where everything's working very very well in balance but the problem is of course when you introduce something externally um, now Although there are numerous different chemicals, drugs and hormones that are created and excreted by the brain, it's useful, I think, to divide them into two, which are stimulants and depressants. Now, stimulants are the things that stimulate us. They increase the activity of the central nervous system and body. Things like adrenaline that make us feel more awake and more alert. Um, on the other hand, we have the depressants, and when I'm using the term depressant, I'm using it in its chemical sense as something that depresses or inhibits nerve activity. Things that make us feel more relaxed and calmer. Um, and I think most people are fairly comf comfortable with this concept, but alcohol is a powerful chemical depressant. So now we've got those concepts in place. So we've got the human brain with its very delicate chemical balancing act and we've got alcohol as a chemical depressant. Let's look at what happens when we drink alcohol, i.e. when we put the two together. Now what we've got here is a fairly simple graph and what I've done on the, as you can see on the left hand side is the stimulants on the right hand side of the depressants. This is you in your naturally occurring state. And with these graphs, what I'd like you to do is to see where the stimulants and depressants are. When they're broadly evened out, that's when you're feeling fairly good mentally. You're feeling fairly resilient and confident and happy. Not to say you're happy all the time because things happen in life that irritate or upset us, but generally you're feeling mentally equipped to cope with whatever life throws at you. So when you take an alcoholic drink, this is what happens. The depressant side of the balance goes up. Now, the problem is because your brain is not a passive object, it is reactive. It reacts to the world around it and to anything that goes on within the body. Your brain senses this imbalance and it seeks to counter it. And it does this by pushing the stimulant side of the scales up. Now, of course, over time, the alcohol is removed from your system. It wears off and that's where you end up. You end up in an overstimulated state. Now, one or two glasses of wine or one or two beers will just leave you feeling slightly more anxious than you would do otherwise. 
it's almost imperceptible. And this is why so many people have lived and died not realising that they've ever suffered from alcohol withdrawal. It's such a minor thing, it's almost easy to miss. But of course, the more you drink, the worse it becomes the next day. And that overstimulation, the main symptom of it is anxiety um, and it can change into full blown depression. And this is essentially what the colloquially named anxiety is, that, that anxiety you get after drinking. This is what it is caused by. It's caused by the overstimulation that in, is itself a result of the previous drinking. Now, there's two ways you can get rid of this unpleasant feeling. One is to wait. The overstimulation, depending on how much is there, will usually be gone with anything between 12 and 48 hours. Um, so you can just wait a bit of time and it eventually wears off. But of course, there's a far quicker way of getting rid of it, and that is to take an alcoholic drink. Because when you're feeling overstimulated, if you take an alcoholic drink, this is what happens. You counter the overstimulation and you get back to a nearer normal balance. And so you feel a huge amount better. Now, for most regular drinkers, these last two slides, this is where they live their lives. Because the overstimulation, that anxiety feeling lasts for so long after you drink, what they do is they spend their entire lives feeling slightly anxious, slightly nervous from the previous drinking. And every evening or whatever it is when they sit down to drink, the main benefit from alcohol is them. That lovely relaxed feeling that they get is actually just them countering the overstimulation caused by their previous drinks. Now let's have a look and see how that feeds into tolerance. Again, we've got the, the basic graph. Now remember, your, the main way your brain is countering the depressant effects of the alcohol is to put up the stimulant side of things. Now in the usual course of events, it doesn't usually need to boost the stimulant side of the scales up that high. So when you first start drinking, and this, the time scales move down, each time it jumps, it will be one alcoholic drink. So when you first in your life have an alcoholic drink, so here you are, you start off, your stimulants and your depressants are roughly equal. You take an alcoholic drink, your body counters it. You take an alcoholic drink, but your body's got no more stimulants to put in. It doesn't have that many in reserve. So as you drink, your body's just incapable of countering it. And that's why when you first start drinking in your life, you can only have one or two drinks. Now, of course, over time, your body becomes much more proficient at creating and releasing these stimulants to counter the depressing effects of the alcohol. So over time you can drink more. And as you can see, tolerance has a direct impact on your withdrawal, because obviously the more stimulants your body can conjure to counter the depressing effects of the alcohol, the worse the withdrawal is going to be. Now let's have a look at moderation and why moderation is so difficult for so many people. Again, we'll take our basic graph um, now, here you are on average evening. Now, let's say every evening for the last 10 years, you've taken eight alcoholic drinks and you can see the number of drinks on the side there on the left. Your brain is then used to countering stimulants, conjuring stimulants to counter the alcohol in eight drinks. Now, let's say that happens every day or most days for several years. The depressants wear off and there are your stimulants, okay? So let's now say you've drunk eight alcoholic drinks every night for the last five years, and then you think to yourself, this is too much. I don't want to stop drinking, I just want to cut down. So you only have two drinks, okay? But the problem is your brain is used to countering eight drinks. So your brain puts in stimulants to counter eight drinks. So the problem with moderation is if you suddenly cut back your drinking, your brain is still countering the higher amount of alcohol. So you end up in a situation where you're overly stimulated from the off. You get that anxiety um, almost immediately, which is why it's so very difficult to cut back the amount you're drinking. It's very easy to drink more and more. It's very, very difficult to drink less and less. Now we've got these basic concepts in place. Let's have a look at alcohol and sleep. Now we've seen how alcohol affects us as human beings, but now let's have a think about sleep. There are numerous different cycles of sleep. We're going to look at two of the main ones, which is um, slow, so there's slow wave sleep, deep sleep, and there's REM sleep. Now the ones two we're going to concentrate really here are deep sleep and REM sleep. 
Now, deep sleep is the very deepest sleep when you're at your most unconscious. And REM sleep is a very strange sleep. And, and when people, have, when scientists have looked into it, your brain lights up almost as if you're fully conscious. Nobody really knows why REM sleep is so important, but it is crucial to our mental and physical health. There's been tests done on rats where they've been deprived of REM sleep and it's actually killed them within a few weeks. So what you need to get in very, very clear into your mind, sleep isn't just a question of dropping unconscious for a few hours and waking up feeling fine. Sleep is a very intricate, complicated process where your body and brain goes through different levels of unconsciousness from deep sleep, which is un fully, deeply unconscious, to REM sleep, where you're almost fully awake. And they're crucial in going through these correct cycles. As you can see at the bottom there, it's normal to have six or seven cycles of REM sleep. When you go through the correct cycles in the correct order and for the correct amount of time, that is when you wake up feeling refreshed and ready to go and happy to face the day. Now let's have a look at what happens when you drink alcohol. <clears throat> Again, so we've got our basic graph here. As you can see, the depressants are slightly higher. The reason for that is when you get to the end of the day and you start winding down for bed, your body is increasing the depressant side of the scales in preparation to put you to sleep. So let's say you have a few drinks of alcohol and there you go. Your depressants are right up. So you fall asleep. But the problem is you can't go through your sleep cycles. Your brain is chemically depressed by the alcohol. It can't move you out of the very deep sleep. It can't take you into those higher levels of consciousness cycles of sleep, which you so desperately need. Now, after about four or five hours, the stimulants kick in and the alcohol starts to wear off. And this is what happens. This is why you wake up at three or four in the morning when you've been drinking and you are unable to get back to sleep. It's also why when that happens, you usually lie there worrying about things. It's not a time where you lie in bed feeling content and happy and just lie there peacefully. You lie there worrying about anything and everything. It's the alcohol withdrawal. It's the overstimulation, overstimulation of the brain. Um, and how I like to think of it, imagine if you need, say, for example, eight hours sleep every night to be at your best and you sleep from, say, 11 at night until seven in the morning. Imagine what it would do to you to set your alarm for three or four in the morning every night and get up and drink four or five mugs of strong coffee just so that you lie there tossing and turning and unable to get back to sleep again for the rest of the night and then get up and it's at seven o'clock absolutely exhausted. That's what you do when you drink alcohol. It puts you to sleep, but it puts you into completely the wrong type of sleep. And it also then prevents you sleeping after about four or five hours. Um, that is why the most common reported symptom of a hangover is actually tiredness. Even one or two drinks disrupts your natural sleep cycle, which is why drinkers are so lethargic and tired most of the time. Now, let's just tie this back to moderation as well, because what you will find is if you're used to drinking, say, three or four glasses of wine and then you cut back and just have one, you can't sleep at all. And this is why. Again, we've got our stimulants and depressants with the depressants slightly high because it's bedtime and your brain's increasing the depressant side of things to get you to sleep. Now, don't forget, usually you drink, say, up to the 100 line, but today you're only drinking to that just below 50 line. Now, your brain doesn't know that you're only drinking that amount. It's used to countering the full 100. So it counters to the full 100. So when you try and moderate, often you'll find you can't go to sleep at all because that first drink is the trigger to your brain to say, right, four or five drinks are coming. But in fact, it's only one. It's trying to counter the four to five. So you're overly stimulated. And that's why often if you try and cut back on your drinking, you sleep even worse than ever because you're simply overstimulated from the off. Now, the last topic we're going to touch on is intoxication and why it's so easy to end up intoxicated when you drink. Now, when people drink, alcohol induces a feeling of relaxation, but it also induces a feeling of intoxication. Now, people have always assumed it's just one process and part and parcel of the same thing. But the two parts do not run their course at the same time. The intoxication outlasts the feeling of relaxation. And again, I think it's helpful just to highlight this 
with a graph. Now, what we're going to have on this graph, it's slightly different. On the left, we've got the feeling of relaxation and on the right, we've got the intoxication. And as you can see, the zero is in the middle here. So when you take an alcoholic drink, you become a small bit relaxed and a small bit intoxicated. Now, the relaxation wears off quite quickly. And as it wears off, it leaves an unpleasant, anxious feeling. So a few minutes after your last drink, this happens. You've gone from zero, which is normal, to plus zero, which is relaxed, to under zero, which means you're overly anxious. So what do you do? You take another alcoholic drink to get rid of that anxious feeling and to get back to that feeling, that nice feeling of relaxation that you had before. And this happens. The intoxication goes up. The relaxation goes up because don't forget the intoxication hasn't worn off. So again, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes after that, you move back into the anxious feeling and the intoxication goes up when you take another drink. Now, what you can see is as you become increasingly intoxicated, the withdrawal gets worse and worse. So as the alcoholic drink wears off, you become overly more and more anxious. So with each alcoholic drink, it becomes that much more important to have the next one. But as you continually chase that, you're becoming increasingly intoxicated. Now, I think that's pretty much everything. I hope you found that useful. Um, if you have, then obviously you can find out a bit more on the website, which is www.alcoholexplained.com, um, which has some further articles there um, and the first five chapters of Alcohol Explained. Thank you.